Okay, I will get started here. First of all, can everyone hear me and see my screen okay? Good, okay, I'm getting some thumbs up. Great, it's always good to get some of those technical things out of the way. So then, hello and welcome to Handy Research Tools for Immediate Use, or How to Tackle Tedious Topics So You Can Get Back to the Science You Love. Perhaps my favorite subtitle of any talk I've ever concocted. So I'm Dr. Mark Williamson, Research Professor, Statistician and Core Coordinator for the Biostats Core. I'll be joined later by Kent Rippinger and Nick Bittner. Kent Rippinger is the Data Navigator for the Biostats Core. And Nick Bittner is a biomedical engineering student and staff member for the Computational Research Center at UND. So a uh, bit of a genesis of this talk. I agreed to give this talk as a backup presenter as needed, because I'm always kind of willing to share the mad cacophony of ideas in my brain. So a concurrent session fell through. Therefore, I condensed some of my most poignant ideas and put them into this talk, and this talk is the result. So the goal of this is to showcase useful research tools that can be quickly and easily implemented, right out of the gate, as it were. To cover as wide of audience as I could, I tailored the tools to appeal to both introductory and seasoned researchers. I hope everyone here attending can achieve at least one of the two outcomes. One, help you to do the things you're already doing better, or two, open the doors to new tools you didn't realize were available. And perhaps if the stars align, you can achieve both outcomes. This is a bit of an introduction to how it's structured. I've structured this into three parts, each with two tools each. Part one is resources you didn't know you had. It'll cover hidden resources on the Dakota web pages and a statistics questionnaire. Part two is called getting more out of your computer. I'll go over Python in 10 and a concept called analysis on a flash drive. Then finally in part three, with the help of my co-presenters, I will help you reimagine what's possible through the use of public use data sets and 3D printing. This is the format for each tool. I'll start with an explanation of the tool followed by a live example or exploration. I'll leave you with a way to immediately use the tool, often with supplying a link to the resource. Um, and I'll also have, so those links will go up in the chat, but I'll also have QR codes on the screen. And worry not if you're going through and you just wanna listen, I will have a master link of links at the end. So if you wanna follow along with the links, great. If not, they'll be there for you at the end. So to re reiterate the story of this talk, I'll start with ready at hand resources, both on the Dakota website and via a statistical questionnaire. Next, I'll leverage your computer with Python coding opportunities and the concept of analysis on a flash drive. Finally, I'll help you reimagine what's possible, both in the ones and zeros of public data sets and the tangible materials of 3D printing. With that out of the way, let's get started with hidden resources you didn't know you had. There are a lot of great resources on the Dakota web pages, a lot of helpful information. As one of the web page, web page editors, I've tried to keep things up to date and realistic to find, but there are certainly limitations. Not everything is obvious, and unless you spend a lot of time exploring, you're apt to miss some hidden gems. So let's take a tour of what I think are some of the best off the beaten path resources. So that's our tool, Dakota Web Pages, and our example will be a quick live tour. Now, there are more gems that I think are helpful. I'll just go over two in the interest of time. So we have the Dakota Web Page here. There is um, information on each core, but where I really want to go here first is additional resources. And the gem I want to talk about is this Dakota Cross-Institutional Scientific and Translational Resource Guide. So this is a PDF. It's updated. Uh, it's a couple years old now, but it still has very good information. 
This is a resource guide that provides the list of the research equipment available at partnering Dakota institutions. So any sort of research for equipment for your research, say you're interested in his, histology, you can see at Sanford Research, they have a cryostat if you need a cryostat. Or at UND, they have a couple different cryostats, as long as information of how you can use them, who you can get in contact with. So this is a great resource. Um, even without Dakota, these equipments are still going to be available at those institutions. So you can avail yourself of this resource. The second gem I want to talk about is a little bit closer to my heart. It is a podcast. So I don't know if you're like me, perhaps you like using podcasts to when you commute or you're doing dishes or whatnot. And I always really wanted a podcast that kind of went over science news, but I couldn't really find a good one. So I ended up making one myself. It's called Science Research Weekly Podcast. It's a weekly overview of helpful scientific research topics. I cover research articles. So new journal articles that I find interesting from astrophysics to soil biology, new research tools like new packages for software, new repositories, et cetera. And then research funding, so interesting grants that might be worth looking into. This is actually a su successor to a more limited statistics podcast. I brought it out for wider use. And you can listen to it right now. You can listen to this on your favorite podcast uh, hosting service, Spotify, whatever else. In fact, the, the most recent ones, so these come out every week on Friday. So the newest one will come out tomorrow, but the latest one from last week is called Dog Bites Dinosaur. So if that's a little teaser for you, you can certainly check it out. And these are very short, seven to 10 minutes and hopefully worth your time. All right, so we went over that. And now to leave you with immediate use, I actually put together a pamphlet with code links to these resources that you can quickly click on. So if you wanna get this pamphlet, here's the QR code. I'll show you what it looks like. It's right here. I'm also going to throw the pamphlet code into the chat. There we have it. And you can see there's things I didn't go over like scaffolds, databases, digital resources. And then here's the ones we talked about today. Next up. I would like to talk about a tool for connecting with statistical support, a new statistics questionnaire. There's often a conceptual gap between the subject matter expert, say you as a researcher, whether you're doing you know, targeted nanoparticle, this delivery of antiprostate cancer drug to xenograft mice, you know, very technical, very expertise. And then on the other side, there's the statistician, you know, me typing on my computer, a generalized linear mixed model in SAS, also very technical in a different way. So I put together the questionnaire to bridge the gap with useful questions to translate the subject specific information from the researcher to the statistics specific approach of the statistician. Now, my initial questionnaire was a Qualtrics survey. It was hard to find, not really used much and clunky. So I totally revised it. I now have for you the revamped statistics questionnaire, now a one-page document, which you can fill out and email to me. It's aimed at getting the ball rolling with statistical support. So let's take a quick example of what this form looks like. As promised, it is in fact one page. Now it's also informally known as the big four questionnaire because I go through four topics. On the top, of course, you need your general information, who you are, your institution, what you're kind of looking for, whether it's a grant proposal or a finished project or anything in between. Part one's the big picture. You know, what are you trying to do? What's your research in a couple of sentences? What kind of support? You know, maybe you have a grant and you just want power analysis, or maybe you have data already ready to analyze and you want not only to help have it analyzed, but you want to teach me how to, me to teach you how to analyze it or anything else. Part two is just general test type. If you kind of have an understanding of what you might want to, how you might want to analyze it or how you think it should be analyzed, that gives me some clues. Variable information is part three, you know, what sort of X and Y variables, what other information might be pertinent. And finally, four is sample data. 
if you have any preliminary pilot data that kind of you often can help understand let me play around with it figure out what what can be done with it as well as if there's any published study that might have similar methodology that gives me clues me into how this might be dealt with so that is available here and uh, let me be clear this is a tool to help you so it doesn't mean you can't informally reach out to me via email for help on a, a research project you totally can if this questionnaire isn't helpful you don't have to use it or if you don't know how to fill out every item on this you can still just send it in with what you have the questionnaire is the start of the conversation not the summit and like before I will throw this up in the chat and the QR code if you like this right away. There we go. Okay. We've got a little touch point, a little breather here. Hopefully everyone's doing okay. Let's get back to understanding where we are at in our story before moving on. We've covered resources on the Dakota website and a statistics questionnaire. So now we will turn to part two, getting more out of your computer. The first tool I'm gonna to focus on is Python coding. Now computer coding is a very important skill. And I'm talking far beyond the kind of coding needed for just, just statistical analysis, like working in R or SAS general purpose coding. For that, I actually use Python. Python is a great introductory coding language whose name is actually a homage to Monty Python. So it's kind of a fun language to learn as well. So you might be asking yourself, why should you care about coding? Well, as an example, I regularly use Python to code and format large data sets. So think thousands or millions of rows of data. With the right code, the computer will do that for me in a few seconds. To do that by hand, so manually checking and modifying an Excel file with millions of entries. Well, to do that, does anyone here have like a room full of undergraduate students I could borrow for a week? Because that's probably what it would take. And so that's just one example of how powerful coding can be. Now, what I'm trying to make the case for here is that one of the biggest pieces of leverage for your computer is basic coding skills. Now, as a busy researcher, I'm not suggesting that you need to necessarily learn coding yourself, but having a team member with basic coding skills is a huge asset. It would be a win-win for a student to pick up, adds a lot of value to your lab, and gives that student a great skill for their journey. So hopefully I've convinced you that maybe you should start looking at some coding. So where to start learning something like Python? Well, the tool I'm gonna to show today is Python in 10, a 10 part slide series, which is actually already available as PDFs in the statistical resources section of the Biostats Core webpage. They are bite-sized, taking about 10 minutes to get through, something I envisioned you'd be able to finish through your lunch break. Now, as a disclaimer, I am self-taught in Python, so I'm sure you can find a much more qualified teacher if you swing a stick around your local computer science department, but, I'm able to do what I need to do in Python. So I have learned enough, as they say, to be dangerous. And I think a lot of what I bring to my training is a very pragmatic approach of not so much the theory, but trying to get stuff done. So hopefully you find that useful. So as an example, let's take a look at uh, what you might find in the, the lunch break session information. You can ignore this top for a second. We'll get back to that. But this is the, the kind of overview of what the parts look like. I start with part one with sort of the getting Python on your computer, you know, a victory in and of itself, some fundamentals, and then really going into pragmatic use cases. So exploring a large data set, splitting data, extracting data, doing a lot with data, manipulating it. And then parts nine and 10 are more about the wider use of things like library work or stepping out into kind of the wider coding world, and then some bonus information. To add depth, this is the, the immediate tool, to add depth and immediacy to this tool, I'll actually be hosting a Python in 10 lunch break sessions in August. So this is that information here. 
you can register now. Registration is open if you want to attend it virtually. Um, it's also going to be in person in the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, E151, if you're interested. So uh, again, I'm going to throw this little session information in the chat so you can get this pamphlet if you want, as well as if you want to register virtually via Zoom. That link is also here. And just the Zoom, this is the Zoom registration. You need your name, email, et cetera. So the sessions are going to be Wednesdays in August. So four out of the five Wednesdays. So skipping the ninth, there'll be about 12 to 12.45. And we'll kind of go over, go over these steps. And if you're tantalized, you're uh, tempted by free coffee to attend in person, I'm going to be providing that. I'm sorry for any of the online registrants. I could not find a virtual coffee option. All right, then. Let's go over part two of part two, a fascinating topic I've been brewing in my head for the last couple of months. This is called analysis on a flash drive. So picture this. You use several open source software packages to analyze some interesting genomic data. You use these packages to open a zip file, extract sequence information, to do all sorts of interesting analyses. A year later, you've got a fresh batch of genomic data and you're ready to do the same thing. Alas and alack, you look through hundreds of icons on your very cluttered desktop and in vain, you do not find any of the items you need. So here's my insight. Why not put everything together to do a certain task on a modular flash drive? Flash drives are portable, handy for compartmentalization, have lots of storage space, and are cheap. I got a USB flash drive with 32 gigabytes of space for $6.88 at Walmart, practically for loose change. A flash drive can be loaded with all the required software and even instructions to perform the analysis needed. If open source software is used, it can be shared between computers, easily copied to new flash drives. Each specific analysis can have its own labeled flash drive. You can hand a flash drive to a graduate student or a colleague with everything needed. Now, I have a lot of really great ideas for different flash drives, basic bioinformatics, virtual machines, large file manipulation, Python, power analysis, you name it. But today, I'll look over one I've already created, a flash drive with open source software for image, audio, and video editing. So that's my example here for this tool. I have a flash drive already plugged in here with this information. So it's called AOFD, Analysis on a Flash Drive, VIN. So I actually set it up so it has three labeled main folders. The biggest one is the software, which has the open source software. The first is Audacity, which is a open source audio editor. There is GIMP2, which is a image editor. It is like the open source version of Photoshop, if you're familiar with that. And then Lightworks is a video editor. And you can actually run all of these straight out of the flash drive if you want to. The only caveat is Lightworks needs, you need to sign into account, but you can create an account for free. The other two files on here, or main files, there's an example file with a variety of image, video, and audio that you can work with in these this software to create this toy example called how-to video example. And to do that, I actually have a guide both in written form with slides of how to use all these, the software and material to create, edit a video, as well as a video of how to edit a video. So if you want to watch it or read it, that's available. So for immediate use, I actually have three flash drives with this software available for a giveaway. Now, originally this was going to be in person, so I was just gonna be able to hand them out, but I can't, but I can still send them to you. So what you can do to get such things is actually have a, just a Qualdic survey. I'll put that link in here. And you just fill out your 
you know, your name, affiliation, email address. And then after the symposium, I'll randomly select three entries and then email the winners to get their address, whether I walk it over to you at UND or I mail it to you at another institution. And that will be the flash drives. Also, now with this analysis on a flash drive kind of thing, feel free to reach out to me if you have a specific idea for an analysis on a flash drive that would be helpful for your research. I'd love to talk with you, see if we can do anything. Oof, all right, let's have a bit of a breather and connect to the wider story. We've leveraged the use of our computers with an opportunity to learn basic Python skills and set up modular flash drives for dedicated analysis. We are at the third and final part, reimagining what's possible. For the penultimate tool, I'll invite the penultimate Kent Ripplinger to tell us about the possibilities of public use data sets. Kent, you can come over and take it away. Oh, sit a little. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. And good morning, everybody. Uh, what I'd like to do is, is give you a little look at uh, some public use data sets that are available pretty much to any researcher or the uh, public at, at, at large. So uh, the, the demo I'd like to show you is CDC Wonder. Um, I'll let you navigate it. Yeah, sure. Easiest thing to do is just open up a browser and type in wonder.cdc.gov. And when you get to the landing page, you'll see uh, the wonder systems tab, the topics tab, and the A through Z index. The wonder systems tab shows you all the available data, data sets that are available for you to browse through and and uh, do some general searches, queries on whatever your area of interest is. What I thought we'd do is just do a quick example of how you could use this resource. So the question we'll start with is, which cancers in North Dakota have the highest incidence rates in 2019? So if you're going to search for that information, you choose the cancer, cancer statistics uh, data set. And when you open that data set up, you'll see that there's four available data sets for your uh, research. It also gives you some archive data that you can go to that other users have requested. And it gives you information on where the data comes from. And you'll see that the data set we're going to we're going to look at, the incidence data, comes from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from the National Program of Cancer Registries and the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results, otherwise known as the SEER program. So the data is very reliable. So we're gonna look at incidence data. To, to start our query, we'll click the data request link. And you'll see it's kind of a nice uh, layout, a step-by-step -step, uh, process that you'll go through to query the data. So we're looking for cancer leading cancer sites in North Dakota in 2019. So we group results by leading cancer sites from our dropdown. It's recommended when you compare data between states and counties that you use age-adjusted rates at a 95% confidence interval. And you, you have the option to add a title. And I'll just, I'll, I'll type in a, a It'll just label it 2019. And so step one is complete. You move to step two, it asks you to select the location. We're gonna just look at North Dakota. So from the list of states, find North Dakota, select the state. And you can see you have various years here that you can choose from. You could, as it says in the hint, you can use control and click for multiple selections. We're just going to choose 2019. You can also, choose your sexes, age groups, ethnicities, races. We're gonna keep them all selected. And step four says select cancers of interest. We are going to choose all 
leading invasive cancer sites. So we want to see them all. And then we'll leave uh, step five as is, where we're just going to show, show the totals. Um, and when you're ready to query the results, you'll click the send button. And this process does not take too long. It depends upon the uh, amount of data you're querying. And you will get a list of leading cancer sites by alphabetical order. You'll get a count, the population, and the age-adjusted rate per 100,000. Now, we wanted to see, I'll, I'll also show you this too. Down below, it gives you some caveats on the data. Like, for example, it will tell you that data is suppressed if there are fewer than 16 cases. Um, that's to protect the, uh, the individuals uh, since there's such a low count. It also gives you a suggested citation if you're going to use this in your research, and it gives you your query criteria so you, you get a kind of a review of what you searched for. So back to the, the, the data itself, we've looked for leading cancer sites in North Dakota in 2019. You can see the title at the top. And what we wanna do is we wanna sort the data. If you hold your cursor over the green arrows, you can sort the data um, we want to sort by age-adjusted rate per 100,000 100, in descending order to see the top results. And you'll notice that prostate cancer uh, and breast cancer are the top two uh, leading cancer sites in North Dakota in 2019. You have some options that you can you know, perform, I guess, at this point with the data. There is, if you go across the top here, these, these uh, tabs, the map option isn't available because you need more than just one state, but it does have the ability to chart the data uh, and you have chart options that you can select if you wanna change the type of uh, how you want the chart to look. Uh, for example, maybe we want a bar chart in 3D and you just select change the chart and you've got that that ability then to save your results. And there's an about tab that also just reminds you of where the data is coming from. So back to the results. If these are results, if this data is data you want to work with, you have the option to export the data as a TXT file. And then you can uh, you could you could use the data in Excel or do any analysis, kind of like what Mark was just describing. Um, the other nice feature about this, if we wanted to compare North Dakota data to data in the United States as a whole, you could go back to the request form. It it remembers your previous search. I would just simply change the title here to instead of North Dakota to to the US in 2019 and change my location to the United States, keep everything else the same if I wanted to compare North Dakota to the United States and hit send. This again does not take very long considering the amount of data. And of course I'd go over to the age adjusted rate per 100,000 and click the sort by descending order to see how North Dakota compares with the rest of the country. You'll see that the same top two prostate and breast uh, cancer sites are the most prevalent. Again, you could export the data as well. Now, I wanted to show you one other thing because when you go back to the CDC landing page, you also have a tab that says topics. And this is a variety of topics that you can choose from, as you can see, the list is pretty long. But what it does when you click, when you select a topic, it takes you to resources that are available um, from the CDC or other uh, organizations. So the thing I wanted to show you is there's a neat little tool called Heart Disease and Stroke Atlas, where, again, this is a resource brought to you by the CDC that allows you to generate maps based on the data you're querying. So it's kind of load and slow, but it's uh, we'll do the same kind of thing. We'll, we'll select North Dakota 
and we will take a look at the stroke data, the death rate for all stroke. And you can see you can select uh, uh, the range of the, the years you're interested in. We'll leave it at 2018 to 2020. You can get specific about the genders, races, and ages, but we'll keep that all as is. And you can apply the, the filters and you'll get a nice map generated with the legend that kind of gives you the age standardized rate per 100,000. So you can see kind of some, some areas that are dark purple that are kind of hot spots for a death rate for all stroke. And you are able to drill into the data at the county level. If you click on the county, you'll see you can view the county profile and the state table. Um, you can also, and I'll just do this real quickly, I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but you can go through uh, for example, you can export the data that is contained in this, this map by selecting the export feature. You can create a PDF of the maps that you create by clicking the PDF uh, option. I'll show you what the preview looks like, but it's, it's a nice little preview of the map, um, whether you can use this in your project or not. So this is just one feature of this very powerful application um, found at CDC Wonder. Uh, hopefully this gives you an idea of what uh, you're able to use just as a public resource. Uh, an example from, you know, that's highly used CDC Wonder from uh, the Center for Disease Control. So thank you very much for your time. I hope that was helpful. And I will turn it over to Mark. All right, thank you so much, Ken. Flip this around. So, uh, like you said, here's just, um, I think he walked through all this, so we'll, we'll jump over. He already showed us this in real time. So to, to add a piece of immediate use, I'm going to link to his list of public use data sets he actually already created for the Dakota project. It's called commonly used public use data sets. He, he does a great job of uh, sorting these all out by different categories, and then there's links to all of them. So I'm sure CDC Wonder is among it. And so great resource. Again, I will add the link to that. So if you wanna get started on looking at what public use data sets are available, this is a phenomenal way to start. All right, for the final tool, I will invite Nick Bittner to share 3D printing, or as I think the professionals would call it, additive manufacturing, show some wizardry with us. Yeah, good morning. Um, thank you, Mark, for that wonderful introduction. I am Nick Bittner. I work with UND's um, Computational Research Center, or just recently renamed the UND Dream Laboratory. And I am a biomedical engineering student here. And I'm also the instructor of advanced manufacturing and 3D modeling at Kandeska Chikna Community College in Fort Totten, North Dakota. So a lot of the projects that I cover, um, they actually look to be uh, related to cell culturing and I'm actually an EPSCoR affiliate. So I do a lot of work with computational fluids and incorporating simulation into how cell culturing would work. But then with those models, we're actually able to build like specialized cell culturing dishes or um, devices that actually fit into like standardized well plates like 6, 12, 24, or 90, 96 we will build um, add-ons so we can split two cell lines so then we can see how they interact when they chemo sense to each other or um, we can build a lot of custom applications. And what happens when I'm talking to a lot of researchers is they go, if only the equipment existed to be able to do this. And I like to coin the phrase, it didn't exist yet. Because if we know what your problems are, we can actually work towards something that could help solve them. 
And that's a lot of the work I do with EBSCOR and with um, most of the groups here at UND, because um, part of my salary comes directly from the research center. So I'm allowed to work with any department that interacts with the school. And so that's what I found myself doing here. And I think a really great example is um, we just were working with a local researcher here at UND, um, Dr. Archana, who needed a specialized wound assay for some of the migration work and the, pol the cell polarity work that she's been doing lately. And I think that's on the next slide. So one of the examples is this work that was done with EBSCOR, where we needed a good way to split two, if we wanted, two different cell lines apart from each other, or just to have a really clean standard way to measure migration from a wound assay. Because the way we do it right now, dragging a pipette tip through a monolayer of cells ends up killing a lot of cells, but the edges are very jagged and it's hard to get really standardized good numbers. But if we had a device that fit, it could make these straight, nice, perfect rectangles like you can see on the screen. Um, this, is actually, this is actually a microscope image of the side. These are the cells on both sides. And then this is the divider that we invented. Um, a lot of this is done through trial and error, but most of these we actually can fabricate. And we just got a uh, plastic injection molding machine at Candesca. So the ability to not only fabricate these with advanced manufacturing at an incredibly affordable rate and customize every individual package, we can also create plastic injection molds and make them at mass if we need to. So a lot of this can be done for labs if you have certain applications that you need to work on. Um, I found just having a normal, good conversation can lead to a lot of really interesting work. And so I'm here to give you how do you make something to get the data that you need for your specific project, whether it be with cells and whether it be with, actually, we just did a really large study with um, the geology department where we ended up digitally replicating the Triceratops skull here at UND's Leonard Hall, or we fabricated artificial core samples from fracking in the oil field where we did cross dimensional analysis on what the fractures that were caused from fracking would be like if we manufactured them and could study them in a laboratory. So we actually used additive manufacturing to build fake real core samples to do all of the flow analysis on them. So just because you can't think of it or you think it's impossible, um, Sometimes there's a way to do a lot of this work that our background is building things. And that's how I help people is figure out a way to build the thing they need. Whether they realize what kind of thing they need or not isn't their domain. It's it's what I do. I like to manufacture. And uh, last year, we actually built a um, a horizontal cellular migration assay device that adhered to the top of just a standard microscope slide. And then we could real time image the cells as they moved through this apparatus using the uh, microscopy core here at the, well, we're, we're at UND's med school right now. And so you could actually plate the cells in this and it had several chambers and they each chamber had a doorway, we would call it in between each area. And utilizing the microscopes they have here, we could actually make uh, real-time imagery that we took in sequential order. And then we could actually do stop motion videos and physically watch as the cells migrated while it happened. And so a lot of this is, is possible. We just need to know what you wanna work on. So with that, mm -hmm. 
we'll give it back to Mark there. Yeah. yeah, to help connect you to that. That is our immediate use. I actually have a, we put together a Qualtrics interest form. Let's take a look at what that looks like here. And before I forget, I will throw that in the chat. So it's just, you know, your name, email institution, and what kind of support you might be interested in. And I think the probably the most important piece is explaining your research needs. Like, what do you need? What do you want to do? And then we can connect you. We fill this out, send this in. We can connect you with uh, the Computational Research Corps, whatever um, gets you started if this sounds interesting. And now, because I couldn't help myself, I'm very interested in the idea of 3D printing. I put together what I call a example gallery, just not, not so much of, hey, this is things you can use right now, but the types of things you could imagine making out of 3D printing, because I had no idea until I really digged into it. You see here, these, these are just a bunch of examples. There's people who've made 3D printed a pipette holder, a gel electrophoresis kit, you know, structural components, um, even a microscope that uh, sands the, the lenses, you know, gaskets, um, valves, even apparently this is a big thing in s s the 3D printing community, parts to create another 3D printer. So that's just a, a thing to get your imagination going. We talked about the gel combs too. I forgot about yeah, that. yeah. And so an uh, example that I thought about is that might be pertinent in the wet lab is say you have a gel comb and you, you run a typical assay where you need 11 wells. So without 3D printing, you're going to have to run two gels, one gel with a, a comb with 10 entries and then another run with just one. But what if you could 3D print a comb with just 11 or with 11 um, tines, I guess you'd call it, or 11 pieces, then you could just one one gel. And that would, what, for pennies, you could essentially run this? I mean, we actually did this for Dr. Combs laboratory last year. I think we made one that had 16. So there we go. So that might be a pragmatic example of how you could easily use 3D printing to improve your lab workflow. All right, let's see here. We've learned in our reimagining step, the wide array of data sets already available for research, and we discovered that 3D printing offers almost limitless potential. So before we get to our discussion portion, I'd like to make some acknowledgments. First of all, thanking Dakota, especially the other cores for helping set up some of the resources for the Population Health Department, especially Dr. Schwartz for all his support and uh, great collaboration with Kent Ripplinger. And then the Computational Research Center, or I think it's the Dream Lab now, especially with Nick for helping with this, and then EPSCoR for funding his uh, his time to help researchers. Okay, we will now have some time for questions, comments, concerns from the audience. It can be directed to myself, Kent, or or Nick. You can uh, type them into the chat, or you can. I guess try try raising your hands. I'll stop stop sharing the screen in a little bit. You can kind of use a little raise your hand icon when we get to that. I'll try to get to everyone in order. And also, as promised, I do have a link to the document with all the other links. The master link, one link to hyperlink them all, is going to be available both on that QR code on the screen and in the chat if you just want a collection of all the links in one document. Okay, with that, I'm going to stop sharing our, my screen and we can come to the discussion portion of the talk. My favorite portion, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And don't be shy. A lot of these conversations, if you're looking at trying something new, start with uh, what if. And it it can be as complicated as let's build a new cell splitter to 
let's uh, find a way to organize all of our pencils or pipette tips so we can sterilize them, which is also a project we may or may not end up doing later this year. <laughs> I threw a lot of information at him this morning, didn't we? Yeah. So. Which is good because this is all mm -hmm. stuff that people don't right away realize at face value what you can do or that you can even have access to it. So, sure. Yeah. Ho ho hopefully, yeah, it might be, maybe it's too much, but hopefully the idea is that it gets you a taste and then there's yeah, uh, information where, where to go from there that you don't need to walk out of this with everything you need to know, but a, a, a series of doors that you know are open that you can walk into when you want to. So. Well, Ken, I do have a question for you. All right. So um, can you give any examples of projects that you've been able to work on with researchers that use a public use data set? Well, uh, I don't remember the exact title, but we we had a researcher from earlier on wanted to access some diabetes research, but not not everything is available in the on the public use side so some of the things that that she was looking for we couldn't quite do with uh, the public use data sets but there are other resources out there that we were able to utilize to help her i also do uh, projects uh, i'm working on a project with dr bassin and with uh, more of a restricted data set and that's with the national covid cohort collaborative otherwise known as the n3c so i mean there's if we can't find um the data you're looking for in the public setting there are other avenues that we can use to to help uh, i just want to make sure everybody knows that we're a resource um, can easily be contacted and are willing to help in any way we can. Yeah. And I think, Kent, th here in, I know you, I worked with you a little bit on the Diabetes Project, and th that's maybe an un, a little bit of an understated good in working with you is, is even if there isn't data, it shows you that, oh, we looked and the data isn't available. So we're not, we're not um, recreating the wheel here to to go out and collect the data with say like a, a clinical trial or right. some sort of research study is that that's almost as important knowledge as there being available data. Correct. And, and there's certainly several avenues we can go down to to look for the data that, that is being requested. Mm -hmm. right. So I had a question for you, Nick. Sure. I, I know some of your projects you can't necessarily talk all the totally about, but um, can you explain more about the, from what you can, the, the 3D prost prosthetic project? Oh, uh, yeah. So there was a, there's actually a paper that we, well, I published last fall that with the bioinstrumentation journal that we developed a way to fabricate lower limb prosthetic limbs. And we actually were able to leverage a lot of geometry um, using advanced manufacturing because we're not limited to uh, subtractive manufacturing techniques like the traditional let's mill away material here or there. It's let's just add material where we need it. So we can utilize a lot more advanced computer programs to do things like topology optimization or um, generative designing and actually still fabricate the shapes. So using a powder bed system that's called uh, selective laser sintering, we built a prosthetic limb out of a type of specialized nylon that is, well, it, it held nine kilonewtons of force, which is nine times exceeding the CDC's requirement for lower limb prosthetic legs. 
and it weighed less than a pound. So <laughs> we can, and it's also made out of a type of nylon or a polyamide that is totally sterilizable, breathable, skin contact, um, biostable, the whole work. So utilizing it um, was as easy as manufacturing a slot to put a standard receiver socket so you could connect it to an existing system. So yeah. All right. Yeah. Oh, was there another question? Any any um any progress on those astronaut boots? <laughs> Actually, um, our grant got funded. Oh, well, yesterday. great, great. Okay. So, yeah. All right. So then, essentially, you're getting paid by NASA to make 3D printed inserts for astronaut boots. Is that a good um, summary of it? It's actually a gate assistance device, so it'll okay. go on the outside, but mm -hmm. it will allow them to walk on the moon and possibly Mars. Okay. So, yeah, we'll okay. be doing that research. We actually got notified of our selection yesterday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So we'll be starting that research at Candesca here mm -hmm. this fall, and then UND's Biped Research Laboratory is actually a sub-award. Oh, sub-award. Great. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So there we go. Your your lab might not need astronaut inserts to walk on the moon, but you know, I'm sure there's I'm sure there's all sorts of other things that can be imagined if you can do that for the moon. So yeah. Well, I guess um barring any other questions, I just want to thank everyone again for taking time to come to this talk. People can start filtering in back to the main Zoom meeting. And at about 9.15, I'll, I'll close the breakout rooms for this time.